Dr. Comstock. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. I'm really Hi, thank you. To, thank you for having me. I, I'm, I'm so excited to speak with you because I think there's, I think this conversation has the potential to not just be enlightening, but also super helpful for a lot of our, our viewers today. So um, I was sort of sharing earlier that I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 36 just last year, and I completed active treatment earlier this year. So I am really excited to talk to you, especially because I was diagnosed at a pretty young age, at the age right. of 36. So, you know, I think, why don't we start with having you sort of introduce yourself and tell us about your work? Yeah, so I'm a breast imaging radiologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I've, um, I've been just doing uh, breast imaging and breast imaging research now for going on 27 years. And I've been, you know, all over. I was at uh, University of Chicago and Northwestern and then uh, section chief at uh, UC San Diego. And then I worked my way out to Sloan Kettering and now I've been here for 15 years. Wonderful. And why don't we talk a little bit also about your BCRF supported research? Right. And uh, it's just so, it's so critical for researchers like me to have this type of support. And uh, really the, the, the vision of Larry Norton, who, you know, I work with and, and refers patients and he's seen the power in uh, my particular interest in contrast mammography. So he's been instrumental in, um, you know, making this happen and happen and supporting this. So um uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about my interest in research, and that's, um, you know, we've we've done mammographic screening now since the, I mean, really, it was, it, it evolved since the 50s. We did, you know, analog or, or film-based mammography for quite a while, and, and then uh, we moved uh, in the mid-2000s to digital mammography, which is a little bit of an improvement, but they, you know, they've all been little incremental improvements, not vast improvements in the uh, screening um, um, detection. And um, and now we have 3D mammography, which is kind of the latest. Again, it's a little bit of an incremental improvement, but um, I think the, the biggest issue with mammographic screening is um, it, it, it's under diagnosis of cancer in that, um, you know, we've we've had eight randomized control trials over the last, you know, since the 60s and, and continuing on, which have shown that mammographic screening um, compared to women who don't undergo screening, the, uh, the patients who undergo screening have anywhere from a 20 to 40 percent reduction in mortality from breast cancer. Um, but surprisingly, the test that's used for screening mammography is probably around a 20 percent sensitivity. So it's not a great test. But it's it's fit the bill over the years because of its availability, its low cost. But um, you know, it's surprising that with such a you know you know poor test uh, that it's it's managed to reduce mortality um, from screening that much. What my interest in is something called vascular based screening, which includes uh, contrast mammography and MRI, which allow you to see the early changes of cancer from the vascularity that changes before you actually see a, a tumor that's big enough to detect on mammography and ultrasound. So, uh, you know, vascular based screening has the ability to really improve sensitivity. And I think, um, you know, despite improvements in therapy over the last, you know, 20 years, um, we, we still have, you know, over 40,000 women die annually uh, from breast cancer. So, I think the, the the quickest improvement and easiest way to to reduce mortality um, significantly is finding more cancers earlier, and that's where vascular based screening, um, such as uh, MRI and contrast mammography, um, allow us to do that. And uh, this study, supported by the BCRF, the CMIS trial, is looking at comparing our 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 best mammographic screening, which is 3D mammography or digital breast tomosynthesis, to uh, contrast enhanced MRI to show, you know, how many more cancers uh, does it detect? And, you know, our early, you know, single institution data looks like it doubles the cancer detection rate. I mean, that's so, pretty incredible. Yeah. So I think I want to dive a little bit into a number of things. But number one, when we're talking contrast enhanced and you say things like vascular, can we talk about literally what that means or what that right. experience is? So, uh, you know, a normal mammographic screening or 3D mammography screening is just an x-ray of the breast. And so it's basically a shadow. The 3D mammography um, 
adds a little bit uh, more information in terms of um, kind of 3D um, view through the breast. It's not it's not true 3 3D like an MRI or CAT scan, but the the just a plain X-ray or ultrasound just relies on seeing a, a, a mass in um, the tissue by seeing its edges or its shape. So you see a, a nodule. The biggest issue, and I failed to mention this, is it's the 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 breast tissue patterns that women have can be very, um, you know, more fat dense, you know, fat density, which you can see through easy versus when you have a lot of breast tissue, it be, the breast is dense, mm -hmm. then you can't see through it as well. And so that's like looking for a snowman in a snowstorm, you know, the more, the more of a storm there is, the harder it is to see things. And so that's the limitation of mammography. And when you have contrast, so with MRI, you have an injection of gadolinium and mm -hmm. the MRI can see that area of contrast and it's not limited by breast density. And the same with contrast mammography. It's it's a mammogram like a conventional mammogram, but prior to that, you have an injection of uh, iodine contrast, which is what we use commonly all the time with CAT scans. Mm -hmm. And so that allows you to see areas that are hidden in the tissue because it's not limited by breast density. Uh, right. And I think that that's what's really interesting because we're talking about this contrast enhanced mammography. And for a patient, what that means is it's an injection. It's really right. simple. It's not something right. that is a different machine. Like it's not that different of an experience. Right. It's more of yeah. a you walk in and it's an injection. Right. I think the access to the, to the mammography is much easier than MRI, which is there's a lot fewer uh, 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 magnets around and, and centers to, to do that at versus Every place has, you know, lots of mammography units which can do contrast mammography. Exactly. So I think that that's really an interesting take on it too, because we're talking about improving technology, but we're not talking about improving technology and having to roll out hundreds of new machines across centers. Right. I mean, we're talking right. about really accessible right. change in the way we conduct screening. Right. Uh, which is really, really interesting. And one of the questions that we wanted to talk about just to outline for patients, you've touched on this a lot already, are sort of the different avenues of screening there are. So we've talked about mammography, MRI, and ultrasound. Can you talk a little bit about just those methods to sort of explain what are the options for patients and right. why certain, why do you choose some over right, others? Right, right. You will well, yeah, get and it's... into breast density for sure. I have a lot of questions about that for you. Right, so. well, and so this is the whole, you know, now that we have, several tests, you know, how do patients and referring physicians decide? And, uh, and I think that's, that's work, an area that we need to work on. And I think it really becomes a, a combination of, um, you know, education of the referring physicians of the, the pros and cons of each test, and also patients who, um, who, know, you know, ha may have preferences on in different tests. And so I think in general, um, you really want a, a program where you, um, have tailored screening based on the patient's risk, their breast density, and how, you know, what level of sensitivity do they want versus, you know, those more sensitive tests may have some false positives. So um, I really see, you know, the program of um, patients who, so there's four, four categories of um, de uh, breast density, right. and uh, there's an A, B, C, and D. And so generally for the, the top two categories, um, uh, uh, C and D heterogeneously and extremely dense, you know, the m mammographic sensitivity is going to drop. So those patients should have some supplemental screening, either a contrast mammography or MRI. Um, and so it's kind of based on your density and your risk. So let's say you're, you don't have a, you don't have any risk factors and you're not dense, you're probably okay with just mammographic screening or mam mammography plus ultrasound. Um, now, if you're dense and you're intermediate risk, you probably would want to do uh, just contrast mammography. And then if you're really high risk, um, you're, you know, that's who we recommend MRI on. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, let's say you're higher risk, but then if you're, let's say a gene carrier, um, which is the highest risk, you may do a combination of both. You may have alternating contrast mammography and MRI, which we see some, from some, some of our referring physicians. So I think it's a work in progress, but I think that's the general idea is a combination of, um, you know, your, your personal history, family history, uh, genetic um, models to assess your risk and your breast density um, to combine to really, um, and to decide what the patient prefers in terms of, you know, some patients may not be comfortable in the MRI. They're 
claustrophobia, and uh, some patients might prefer contrast mammography. Um, and lastly, um, you know, there are new methods. Um, Connie Lehman, who's also uh, uh, one of the research at, at, at BCRF and whose work has been supported uh, at MGH and with collaboration with uh, MIT, has really a novel work on. So it's not just your family history and your genetic, uh, you know, these different, you know, Tyracusic and different models, uh, BRCA Pro, et cetera. But her work has shown that with AI, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and, and um, computer imaging, that there's a certain, you know, patterns in, 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 a, in a woman's mammographic pattern um, that can inf that infer higher risk. So I think in the future, we're going to see a whole, you know, new, you know, type of, you know, based on family history, but also um, uh, artificial intelligence, looking at your patterns of your mammogram and combining that to say, you know, what should be the best program uh, mm -hmm. for you. Right. And now we're talking about machine learning to not just um, detect cancers, but also predict future cancers as well, right? But I do want to talk a little bit more just the basics of dense breasts as, as well as, um, and then we'll get into sort of the risk-based screening and sort of what we're hoping to do there as well and the role that CMS plays in that. You know, it's an interesting, uh, you know, there's no formalized pathway in, you know, in breast imaging or in radiology that for adopting new technologies, it's kind of, you know, hit or miss. And uh, and so that's the that's really the the goal of the CMIST trial, which stands for Contrast Mammography Imaging Screening Trial, uh, which, you know, the BCRF is, is supporting is, you know, to, to get some basic phase two data and a, you know, major publication to really foster adoption. I mean, it takes, you know, a, a multi-center trial and, and, a, and a major publications and, you know, the, the, the actual, the community of breast imaging, the Society of Breast Imaging and its members, it, this is a very hot topic. But, you know, one of my frustrations is it's just, it, it, things change very slowly and it's it's hard to, you know, we know the power of this technology, but it's really working on the research and the science to try to get, uh, to promote adoption. And that's, I think, really the the main goal of the CMIS trial is to show how well it works in a in a very scientific, you know, multi-center fashion. And that way, you know, referring physicians and, you know, other radiologists will see that and, and decide, hey, this is something we need to offer to our patients. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that I wanted to highlight is that you've sort of mentioned it, but I really want to drive home the success of contrast enhanced mammography as far as reducing false positives or even false negatives. So you were talking about improving screening by double. I, I read that it could be up to 80% improvement. I mean, those are pretty huge right. numbers when right. we're talking about improving screening. So right. I just want to underscore right. that. I mean, we're not talking about improving screening by 10%, 20%. Right. We're talking about a huge amount right. of improvement. Exactly. It's, um, you know, it's also, uh, and this study will look at, you know, what, so it's important information, you know, when you have a test for patients and referring physicians to know, you know, does it have you know, high false positives and unnecessary biopsies. Um, generally, you want to study not just that for because the first time they have a test, you're seeing things that might have been there before, but you don't have a comparison. So there's, there, you know, your baseline, like when a patient gets their first mammogram, there's obviously going to be a higher callback rate and you may need, you know, things biopsied. But going forward, which is called the incident round screening, um, you know, now that you have comparisons, that that sh and, and that's most of the screening women have if they're going to get screened for 20, 30 years um, or longer, um, th that those rounds should be, um, you know, less false positives and less unnecessary biopsies. And so, um, yeah, the, the information is important to know. We already have a good sense that it's going to close to double the, you know, as you said, 80% to hundred percent increase in sensitivity, but we want to show also that it's, you know, well tolerated and the, um, the false positives are, are low. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. There, you know, was that new study, of course, that there's been this increase in incidence in women under the age of 50, and of course, an 8% increase in incidence in women ages 30 to 39. And, you know, we've, of course, long known that incidence has been on the rise, but this was the first study that really um, quantified that, in, that, that increase in risk in that younger age group, which is particularly vulnerable because they're not being screened annually. Right. Or should right. they be screened annually, right? It's sort of what we talked about earlier, that risk <clears> screening and talking with your doctor and deciding what those factors are. But um, one of the things 
that I find fascinating is that most of these young women who are being diagnosed or so many of them, I shouldn't say most, but you know, in, I'm so tuned into this community as well of breast cancer patients so often and more often than not, you'll hear how patients brought the diagnosis to their doctor or right. said, I feel this lump and the doctors right. will always inevitably really not recommend mammography. They really, they really don't want to has, you know, recommend screening. And I don't necessarily, I've been struggling with that because I don't think it's that doctors don't care. Like your PCPs don't care. Your primary care physician doesn't care about you or that they, I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that they have less faith in the accuracy right. of mammography right. and so they don't want to put patients who again it's still it's not while it's more common it's still fairly uncommon in the general population right. so they are more likely to not recommend screening because of dense breasts and the rate of false positives and unnecessary biopsies i always say you know when you hear biopsies in general you kind of think oh that's that can't be so bad but then you're a patient right. and you get a biopsy and then you get that biopsy bill and you realize, wow, right. so this yeah. is really expensive. Right. It's a huge financial burden associated right. With, right. with biopsies. So I do think that one of the reasons I'm so hopeful about CMIST is that I love this idea that it will improve confidence specifically for people with right. breasts. And that's right. the majority of, of patients under 40, right? So right. Uh, yeah, yeah, you I, know I want to talk about that as well. Your your sort of idea of what risk based screening should look like, right? Uh, the the forty to fifty age range is where there's a, a fair amount of debate, and you know some organizations and the uh, United States uh, Preventative Task Force, you know they they kind of left that up to patients talking to their doctors and didn't really recommend that versus you know the American Cancer Society or the 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 American College of Radiology clearly. Um, have for a long time, the recommendation's been uh, screening starting at age 40. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, the, the things we have to be, as you mentioned, false positives and un unnecessary biopsies. I think um, some of that modeling and the recommendations from the, the task force factored in, you know, the anxiety or stress from having an unnecessary biopsy or being called back and the anxiety from that. And I don't think they give women enough credit, really, because um, I, I know, um, you know, like ultrasound screening, ultrasounds, not the, that has a fair high, high false positive, but women seek it out because they'd rather have their breast cancer found over, you know, kind of that, you know, it, the anxiety, but it's, it's a short event. It's, you know, coming back or, you know, it's over a week or so, or they get a biopsy and it turns out to be benign. And, you know, it's, it's uh, most biopsies should not be uncomfortable, but you know, the anxiety and that, but I think uh, most women would prefer to undergo that. And then, you know, that, that fades away. That's not a permanent um, aspect, uh, negative aspect versus, you know, I didn't get this, you know, I didn't get screening and now I have this palpable lump that with, with nodes positive and there, the anxiety of, Hey, I, I wish I had, you know, done more screening. So I think those recommendations from at least some of the organizations and, and like you say, the referring physicians, their hesitancy is because of some of that information from the task force that mm -hmm. I think use, I, I think they overuse the modeling data on anxiety and the harms of mammography. And so I think you're right that the, some physicians kind of are hesitant to uh, recommend screening as much as they should. Uh, but I, I think the CMIS trial and contrast mammography may help to show, hey, this is a much more sensitive test, has lower false positives. And, uh, you know, its utilization, well, particularly in women with uh, dense breast tissue, will, will be a big positive in general. Exactly. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think as a woman and reading that about the, including that in the modeling, uh, the idea of anxiety, I always say like, there's nothing like the anxiety of a woman who's been diagnosed at a later stage. Right. Like right. There, there is no comparison to right. the anxiety of screening versus now being diagnosed at a later stage. And I think, yeah. you know, personally, as I was saying, a lot of young patients specifically, when they go in to talk about risk factors, even that can be a, a longer conversation to be had with doctors. I think, like you were saying, starting in your 20s, just talking, just having that conversation with your doctor to outline what your risk factors are and when you should begin screening is really, really important. So 
um, no, I, I'm I'm with you on that, and and right. even that regret as far as not advocating for your own um, screening or mammography can be really a, a big regret later. Um, yeah, yeah. So I uh, I was the same. I I had felt a palpable lump by the time I was diagnosed. As as most young women, I think eighty percent of young women right. find their own lump. I mean, we've been talking about dense breasts for quite a while now, but. Right. Why talk about like what are dense breasts right like what what it what are they and also I know that you mentioned a little bit earlier as well the FDA just required that imaging facilities now let patients know that they have dense breasts right right. so what are they and then once you find out you get that letter you have dense breasts now what so right why don't we start so okay yeah so there's always been in mammography um there's something called the Mammography Quality Standards Act, which has helped to really uh, standardize mammographic screening and the reports. So it's more clear for physicians what they need to do and if they need to do biopsies. But um, breast density, uh, as I mentioned, there's four categories. And you can imagine, um, uh, you know, the breast is like other organs in the body, the pancreas, kidneys, you know, it's, it's excretory, it, you know, it's, it's made to produce, you know, milk, obviously, during uh, pregnancy. So, it has kind of um, tubes and structures in it. So imagine it's like the a tree branches. The more leaves you have, then the more you know dense you are. So you could have you know just the branches and not much many leaves. And so that's a non-dense pattern. That's you know, mostly just you know the breast is just fat, mostly fat density. And so that you can see through very easily. You could see if there's a bird sitting on a branch and, you know, or let's say you'd call it a crow, (laughs) but, uh, so, but the more dense than the more leaves. And so some, some patients are extremely dense where you, you can't see anything in sitting on a branch anywhere. And so, um, that's the whole aspect of breast density. Now, you know, I feel kind of the media and our, And radiology community in general, I think back in the 60s and 70s when mammography was rolling out during the the uh, the American Cancer Society war on cancer, and that's you know kind of the time when breast imaging became a specialty, and and when uh, mammography and breast cancer screening really got promoted. Um, I I hate to say it, but I think we we oversold mammography. You know, it's not a cholesterol test where, you know, you put a sample and you get a number out. It's, it's, you know, based on the radiologist experience and, and um, ability to, you know, detect these patterns in, in the pat in the mammogram. But so in the last 10 years, um, it partly through grassroots and an organization, there's a a website called are you dense? Um, it came through because you had enough women, you had, you know, congresswomen, you had congressmen's wives who uh, had a lump, they went to their doctor, and they were, you know, biopsied and told it was a cancer. And they said, wait a minute, I had a mammogram three, four months ago. And it took enough of this grassroots movement to to create legislation. It, it's now a federal, uh, but it, it was in many states um, that basically you know, said, hey, you, you, we need to notify patients if they have that top two category. Um, the, the, so so automatically now with a, your report from your mammogram, it's a letter that says, you know, hey, if you have dense breast tissue, you are you may be number one at, at increased risk. And that's because, you know, the more, you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, the more breast tissue cells, the, the, you have a higher chance of one going awry and becoming cancerous. So it, the letters inform you that you may be at an increased risk and also that your mammogram may not be as, as, uh, as good at detecting cancer. So you just should talk to your physician about supplemental screening. Now, these, the density legislation in these letters don't specify which particular test. Um, for a long time, because you know, it was available and most familiar with referring physicians and gynecologists and et cetera, that, you know, ultrasound was kind of the default screening test. Uh, but again, it's it's morphology based. It's based on finding the shapes of things. It's not vascular based. Um, it does improve some sensitivity um, by maybe 40, 50 percent, um, 30, 40 percent, depending on your risk level. Um, uh, it's fairly time consuming, expensive and, and has false positives. But that you know, that turned out to be kind of the uh, default test for women who've got the density letters and and looked into supplemental screening. Um, You know, at at Sloan Kettering in in the breast imaging department, when I started, you know, 
12, 13 years ago, um, we didn't do many whole breast screening and ultrasounds. And when the, the laws changed in New York, we, we, we do 30, 40 a day now. It's been done for quite a while, but really it's not an efficient, you know, mammography plus whole breast screening ultrasound still isn't, you know, the sensitivity is still not that great. And so that's where now with MRI and uh, contrast mammography, we can, we can uh, you know, double that detection rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's really important to talk about is just because um, part of the calculation in terms of improving technology is also that efficiency and that access, the accessibility right. to patients right. as right. far as what screening is available to them. And I think that that's really important. And, you know, we've been talking about, you know, breast density. We talked about what it is. And I, I want to talk about how common it is also, because I think that's another question is we've been talking right. about, you know, as I, I believe the number is women in their 50s have uh, about 40% of women in their 50s have dense breasts and that number increases the younger you are, right? Right. So yeah, generally about half of, you know, half of the screening population fall into the dense category and the other into the non-dense category. Um, but the younger you get, the, the, the proportions change. So, um, you know, obviously in the, in the 40 and 50, you're going to have more than half that are in the dense. You know, as as women get older and postmenopausal, um, you see the breast density decrease somewhat. So, um, you know, it goes along with density is goes along with you know younger age, and uh, we see it more in patients at that screening um, age. Right, right. And so, um, as you said, as you get older, breasts tend to get less dense. Um, and as you're younger, you're more likely to have dense breasts. And right. interestingly, dense breasts are considered also a risk factor for being diagnosed with breast cancer as well. And sort of what you said before, just the, the number of breast cells available. Right. It's kind of like lottery tickets, right? right. The, the more tickets you have, the, you know, the chance your, your number could be called versus if you buy one ticket, you know, you're not dense. The chances of um, that you know, those fewer cells having a cancer develop and it's just related to the sheer number of right. breast tissue cells. Yeah. That's available. And, and we've talked about screening, especially for dense breasts. And you had touched on it earlier, sort of the, you know, combination. So it's not just mammogram alone. It'll be some combination of either MRI or whole breast ultrasound. You mentioned also um, potentially alternating. So what does that mean? What do you mean by alternating? So there's 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 not a lot of data, but in general, it's kind of accepted that um, it, you know some patients instead of getting both their screening, let's say they're doing uh, mammography and ultrasound or MRI, um, that if you spread them out, you do one and then six months later, you're in essence getting you know a test every six months, mm -hmm. which may you know, potentially find something that was just not visible at the time of screening. And then, you know, a few months later, now it's seen on the second test. Mm -hmm. There's no real studies or data, but so some people, you know, do that where they'll do an alternating rather than having the screening at the same time, they'll have them six months apart. Mm -hmm. But, and I was talking about uh, some, you know, gene carriers or, or, you know, BRCA carriers, they're, you know, they're at such a high risk, you actually might do to, you know, an MRI and a contrast mammo, mm -hmm. at, you know, six months apart. So you're getting double screened, you know, in essence. Right. Um, and we, we see some of our, you know, from the high-risk clinic referred for that type of program. Right, right. Okay, great. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about our hopes for, for CMIST and, and screening and young women and with, um, in all populations and especially for, for those with dense breasts. You know, what are, what do you see also, and you've, you've touched a little bit on, on Dr. Lehman's work. Um, what are, what are some of the most promising areas of research or screening that, that you're most excited about? Uh, well, you know, as, as I mentioned, I think the, the quickest, the low hanging fruit to really, you know, reducing mortality in, in a way that we haven't seen since the initiation of mammography. So I think we really need to work on the detection side of things. Now, in the long run, there's, there's, um, you know, obviously, you know, liquid biopsy would be a very, you know, something you could potentially do at home, uh, access wise would be, but the technology just has, 
you know, probably 15, 20 years in my guess to really, it's not going to replace mammographic screening or, or MRI or contrast mammography because it's just, it's just not sensitive enough right now. But I think it will have a role. Obviously, things improve over time. So I think I think for now, contrast mammography and then further in the future, liquid biopsies, where you can detect whether a patient has cancer just by doing a quick blood blood test. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So and, and let me add, let me add one more. I was just at an advisory meeting on really the next, and I really like this. Uh, one of the companies had this advisory meeting and they had a a, a company that that kind of um uh, ran it and and basically they said, okay, you're in 2043. Mm -hmm. Okay, 20 years from now, tell me what you see and 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 the things that are, need to happen and are going to change. And the other thing I would bring up would be, you know, vaccines for breast cancer. I mean, those also uh, could be potentials for certain, not all types, but some types of cancer. So I think, you know, we're coming at it from from multiple uh, fronts, and hopefully, you know, within the next 20 years, we can significantly reduce. You know, we we should reduce significantly um, die, you know, women dying from breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, what every patient wants to hear, I think. Uh, and I, and I, it leaves me quite hopeful for what the future holds, not necessarily just for patients, but also for future patients. And I did want to touch a little bit. I know that CMIST, um is, is on its way and it started right. to enroll patients. Um, how how soon do you think we're bringing that to the bed? Like, how, like what's the time frame that you think in the next five to 10 years that contrast enhanced you think if again, it proves right. out to well, be- Well, I think within the next, you know, five years, you know, once the, you know, the results, the early results should be out in, you know, probably three years. Um, from the first round of screening. And generally then once that's published, um, I think more and more centers will start offering it for their patients. And so um, I don't think it's a long-term, I think it's a short-term five years where we see, um, you know, that's what happened with the abbreviated MR now. We see uh, probably a hundred centers now offering that across the country because of that that study through the NCI and that, that publication. So, uh, and the, the fact that it's, you know, a center doesn't have a breast MRI or a, a, an MRI unit, they have to use the general radiology MRIs. And so they're kind of competing for time. Um, but with this mammographic screening in contrast, mammography is, is widely available. So it's very easy for a center to offer that. So I could see a much more rapid uptick in, in offering that to patients who seek it out and say, you know, I'm, I'm dense, I'm intermediate risk. I'd like, I'd like something more than just ultrasound. And um, so I, I see it in the near near term, really, and that's the goal of CMIST. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's so, um, I mean, I've been talking about how excited I am about this, but I think just sort of the factors that you um, outlined, the accessibility, the ease of unrolling it, the success rates, and hoping that as more centers, like you said, are become more, become aware of the study that you're, the results of that study in the next few years, Right. More willing to adopt contrast enhanced mammography, right. we'll see that sort of rapid rise of its use. Right. I think. And, and the referring physicians too, as they get exactly. the right. information. Yeah. I right. find that that's one thing I feel super passionate about is not just the patient, because I feel like a lot of patients are fairly uh, like they're pretty knowledgeable and they'll go right. they're the ones that are maybe like i said especially in younger groups that are not again being screened when you're when, when you are regularly being screened we want to improve the accuracy of mammography yeah. no matter what age right so of yeah. course it's important in that level but when we're talking about younger patients who are not being screened and especially um having knowledgeable physicians who feel confident in recommending screening to a certain patient, I think right. I'm hoping that we, we we improve survival for that cohort as well. Because I, I think right. that's that's what I find disheartening is that a younger patient group that is, again, not being screened and shouldn't, shouldn't be getting screened unless they're deemed high risk. So there's that two-pronged approach of doing a better job at risk assessment, identifying those that need to be screened. Obviously there's a gap there, but also now when it comes to screening, making sure that they're properly getting accurate. Yeah. And they have a better test, yeah. yeah. Exactly, more, yeah. more accurately getting screened and, and catching it early. Cause that, that's what I think is so 
um, painful for young patients is that we know that, you know, breast cancer is essentially curable when caught right. early, you know, there's such exactly. a high cure rate. It's, it's just that when it's caught later that it becomes right. lethal, dangerous. So yeah, if I could, I mean, just something to add at the end here, it's, it's, you know, I've been in breast imaging now going on 30 years and, um, I, I, we're, I think we're at a time when I think we're ready for a new paradigm in screening. I mean, we've been doing mammography. Now we have 3D mammography and we've done ultrasound. But really, this is this is kind of mammography. This is breast cancer screening 2.0 now that we move into the vascular based screening. And, and I think I think I think women in society are really ready for, you know, something new that it's been a long time, you know, that we've really said, hey, Here's a, a major change in how we can screen. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I really, you know, really and it's, it. yeah. and I have to say that, you know, this couldn't have been done with this absolutely, you know, obviously it's in partner with the vendors, but this could not have been done. And we've opened up, we're about to open at Sloan Kettering and that'll be, we're almost up to, uh, we have four, this will be five and pretty soon six sites open. We hope to, ha hope to have about 14 sites, but it could not have been done. And uh, without the BCRF support and sticking in, sticking with us and hanging in there despite COVID delays, FDA delays, and then shortages and, you know, staffing afterwards. So, um, and Larry Norton has been just instrumental in, in having the vision. And I think because he uses it on his patients and he sees the power and uh, we, uh, you know, we could not have gotten this trial off and running without BCRF and, and Dr. Norton. So, uh, um, and Doria from, from the BCRF. So uh, I'm, uh, I just want to get, get it accrued now and, and get the results published. Right. I mean, we'll be, you know, waiting with bated breath for sure. I, I, I certainly <laughs> will be. Right. And I think that we're, we're really excited to, to see Timus come to fruition and, and see what the results look like so that it can be adopted more readily across the country so that more patients are able to access it and, right. and have better results with screening. Yeah. And, right. and, you know, the data, there's lots of uh, information hopefully we can use. And, you know, I've talked to Dr. Lehman about um, potentially using some of her AI tools and looking at the patterns. And so, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of other aspects that this, this trial will, will help lead to, you know, examining. And I think that's an important topic because I, you know, BCRF, one of the things that not only do we um, love to support, but love to nurture is that collaboration. It's that collaborative spirit of working with other investigators at different institutions, um, wherever that might lead. So right. I think that that's really exciting to hear about this opportunity potentially. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining okay. us. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think we've we've covered it for now. You can have me back on when we have the results published. Yes, okay, <laughs> I would love that. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Comstock, for, for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. Bye.